This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twilight of the Idols by Friedrich Nietzsche Chapter 3 Quote, reason, unquote, in philosophy. 1. You ask me what all idiosyncrasy is in philosophers? For instance, their lack of the historical sense, their hatred even of the idea of becoming, their Egyptianism. They imagine that they do honor to a thing, by divorcing it from history, subspecie eterni, when they make a mummy of it. All the ideas that philosophers have treated for thousands of years have been mummied concepts. Nothing real has ever come out of their hands alive. These idolaters of concepts merely kill and stuff things when they worship, they threaten the life of everything they adore. Death, change, age, as well as procreation and growth, are, in their opinion, objections, even refutations. That which is cannot evolve. That which evolves is not. Now, all of them believe, and even with desperation, in being. But, as they cannot lay hold of it, they try to discover reasons why this privilege is withheld from them. Quote, some merely apparent quality, some deception, must be the cause of our not being able to ascertain the nature of being. Where is the deceiver? Unquote. We have him, they cry rejoicing. It is sensuality. These senses which, in other things, are so immoral, cheat us concerning the true world. Moral. We must get rid of the deception of the senses, of becoming, of history, of falsehood. History is nothing more than the belief in the senses, the belief in falsehood. Moral. We must say no to everything in which the senses believe. To all the rest of mankind, all that belongs to the people. Let us be philosophers, mummies, monototheists, grave diggers. And above all, away with the body, this wretched ide fix of the senses, infected with all the faults of logic that exist, refuted, even impossible, although it be impudent enough to pose as if it were real. With a feeling of great reverence, I accept the name of Heraclitus. If the rest of the philosophic gang rejected the evidence of the senses, because the latter revealed a state of multifariousness and change, he rejected the same evidence, because it revealed things as if they possessed permanence and unity. Even Heraclitus did an injustice to the senses. The latter lie neither as the Eleatics believed them to lie, nor as he believed them to lie. They do not lie at all. The interpretations we give to their evidence is what first introduces falsehood into it. For instance, the lie of unity, the lie of matter, of substance, and of permanence. Reason is the cause of our falsifying the evidence of the senses. In so far as the senses show us a state of becoming, of transiency, and of change, they do not lie. But in declaring that being was an empty illusion, Heraclitus will remain eternally right. The, quote, apparent world, unquote, is the only world. The, quote, true world, unquote, is no more than a false adjunct thereto. 3. And what delicate instruments of observation we have in our senses. This human nose, for instance, of which no philosopher has yet spoken with reverence and gratitude, is, for the present, the most finely adjusted instrument at our disposal. 
it is able to register even such slight changes of movement as the spectroscope would be unable to record. Our scientific triumphs at the present day extend precisely so far as we have accepted the evidence of our senses, as we have sharpened and armed them, and learned to follow them up to the end. What remains is abortive, and not yet science. That is to say, metaphysics, theology, psychology, epistemology, or formal science, or a doctrine of symbols like logic in its applied form, mathematics. In all these things, reality does not come into consideration at all, even as a problem. Just as little as does the question concerning the general value of such a convention of symbols as logic. 4. The other idiosyncrasy of philosophers is no less dangerous. It consists in confusing the last and the first things. They place that which makes its appearance last. Unfortunately, for it ought not appear at all, the highest concept, that is to say, the most general, the emptiest, the last cloudy streak of evaporating reality, at the beginning, as the beginning. This again is only their manner of expressing their veneration. The highest thing must not have grown out of the lowest. It must not have grown at all. Moral. Everything of the first rank must be causa sui. To have been derived from something else is as good as an objection. It sets the value of a thing in question. All superior values are of the first rank all the highest concepts, that of being, of the absolute, of goodness, of truth, and of perfection. All these things cannot have been evolved. They must, therefore, be causa sui. All these things cannot, however, be unlike one another. They cannot be opposed to one another. Thus, they attain to their stupendous concept, God, the last, most attenuated and emptiest thing is postulated as the first thing, as the absolute cause, as ens realissimum. Fancy humanity having to take the brain diseases of morbid cobweb spinners seriously, and it has paid dearly for having done so. 5. Against this let us set the different manner in which we, you observe that I'm courteous enough to say we. Conceive the problem of the error and deceptiveness of things. Formerly, people regarded change and evolution, in general, as the proof of appearance, as a sign of the fact that something must be there that leads us astray. Today, on the other hand, we realize that, precisely as far as the rational bias forces us to postulate unity, identity, permanence, substance, cause, materiality, and being, we are, in a measure, involved in error, driven necessarily to error. However certain we may feel, as the result of a strict examination of the matter, that the error lies here. It is just the same here as with the motion of the sun. In its case, it was our eyes that were wrong. In the matter of the concepts above mentioned, it is our language itself that pleads most consistently in their favor. In its origin, language belongs to an age of the most rudimentary forms of psychology. If we try to conceive of the first conditions of the metaphysics of language, i.e., in plain English, of reason, we immediately find ourselves in the midst of a system of fetishism. For here, the doer and his deed are seen in all circumstances. Will is believed in as a cause in general. The ego is taken for granted. The ego as being and as substance and the faith in the ego as substance is projected into all things. In this way alone, the concept thing is created. Being is thought into and insinuated into everything as cause. 
from the concept ego alone can the concept being proceed. At the beginning stands the tremendously fatal error of supposing the will to be something that actuates a faculty. Now we know that it is only a word. Translator's note. Nietzsche here refers to the concept free will of the Christians. This does not mean that there is no such thing as will, that is to say, a powerful determining force from within. End translator's note. Very much later, in a world a thousand times more enlightened, the assurance, the subjective certitude, and the handling of the categories of reason came into the minds of philosophers as a surprise. They concluded that these categories could not be derived from experience. On the contrary, the whole of experience rather contradicts them. Whence do they come, therefore? In India, as in Greece, the same mistake was made. Quote, we must already once have lived in a higher world, instead of in a much lower one, which would have been the truth. We must have been divine, for we possess reason. Unquote. Nothing indeed has exercised a more simple power of persuasion hitherto than the error of being, as it was formulated by the Eleatics, for instance. In its favor are every word and every sentence that we utter. Even the opponents of the Eleatics succumbed to the seductive power of their concept of being. Among others, there was Democritus in his discovery of the atom. Reason in language. Oh, what a deceptive old witch it has been. I fear we shall never be rid of God, so long as we still believe in grammar. 6. People will feel grateful to me if I condense a point of view, which is at once so important and so new, into four theses. By this means, I shall facilitate comprehension, and shall likewise challenge contradiction. Proposition 1. The reasons upon which the apparent nature of this world have been based, rather tend to prove its reality. Any other kind of reality defies demonstration. Proposition 2. The characteristics with which man has endowed the, quote, true being, unquote, of things, are the characteristics of non-being, of non-entity. The, quote, true world, unquote, has been erected upon a contradiction of the real world, and it is indeed an apparent world, seeing that it is merely a morallo-optical delusion. Proposition 3. There is no sense in spinning yarns about another world, provided, of course, that we do not possess a mighty instinct which urges us to slander, belittle, and cast suspicion upon this life. In this case, we should be avenging ourselves on this life with the phantasmagoria of another, of a better life. Proposition 4. To divide the world into a, quote, true, unquote, and a, quote, apparent, unquote, world, whether after the manner of Christianity or of Kant, after all, a Christian in disguise, is only a sign of decadence, a symptom of degenerating life. The fact that the artist esteems the appearance of a thing higher than reality is no objection to this statement, for appearance signifies once more reality here, but in a selected, strengthened, and corrected form. The tragic artist is no pessimist. He says yea to everything questionable and terrible. He is Dionysian.
End chapter 3 This recording is in the public domain.